Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Find more episodes and subscribe on your favorite platforms. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com. In this episode of Writing Matters, I have a far-ranging conversation with my friend and colleague, Kate Roberts. We talk about her path of becoming the child of a writer and a teacher and where she did not want to go with her career, but then where she has become ultimately a literacy coach, an independent consultant, and an author who influences the lives of teachers and students across the country. Welcome to Writing Matters. Today, we get to speak with a colleague and friend that I've made in the past few years, Kate Roberts, who is a teacher, a guest teacher, an author, most recently of her own book, A Novel Approach, which focuses on the balance of whole class and student choice reading. And also, as we were talking before we began, a very busy consultant and someone with a family life that uh, I can certainly understand and appreciate. So welcome, Kate. It's great to talk to you today. Thanks, Troy. It's great to be here. Thanks. So as we begin, um, I know that little twitter size bite of uh, your bio I just gave is not nearly enough. So tell us a little bit about your pathway uh, in education. How have you arrived at this moment that you are a consultant and author and working with teachers around the country? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I swore, I grew up, I was a kid of professors. My dad was an English professor and my uh, stepfather was an English professor. Um, so the two things I swore I would never do when I was growing up was teach or write. <laughs> <laughs> and as luck would have it or life would have it, I guess, right? Um, you know, I graduated college uh, and... I wandered around from job to job to job. I really tried hard not to teach, I have to say. You know, I, I tried every <laughs> other profession um, I possibly could. And then, you know, nothing fed me, really, you know. And I got this, um, I was doing theater at the time. I was a playwright, and it was going okay. And I got this job as a teacher in residence um, in Hartford um, at a theater called The Bushnell. And I was working in middle school classrooms, teaching playwriting to middle school kids. And uh, the night before I went into my first class of sixth graders, um, I couldn't sleep. And I called a friend of mine and I started sobbing. And she was like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm so nervous. And she's like, they're sixth graders. She's like, <laughs> she was like, who cares? You know, like, and I was like, I do. Like, for some reason, and I had done plays. I had, you know, done all of these risky things in my life. And there was something about walking into a classroom of sixth graders that before I even did it for the first time mattered more to me than any of that other stuff. So I came late in a way, like I didn't have a calling. I just stumbled into it. And as soon as I walked into a classroom, I felt this feeling of uh, humility and terror of like, I'll never be done with this, right? Like I'll never learn how to do this. and. I think that captures my journey in a lot of ways is like I became a teacher, I became a middle school teacher in Brooklyn. Um, I taught eighth grade. Um, uh, then I became a literacy coach in a school in Brooklyn. And during my time as a literacy coach, uh, I started working with the reading and writing project out of Teachers College, Columbia University, and then joined up with them. Um, worked for them for about 12 years uh, as a consultant. Um, and uh, really loved, I really loved being able to go to so many different schools all around the country and like see what teachers were doing, see that kids are good everywhere, no matter where they're from, right? Kids are kids, um, teachers are teachers, everyone's working real hard and to really see the, the beauty of all of that. Um, I was lucky enough at the end of my time at the project to uh, co-write with Christopher Lehman um, a book called Falling in Love with Close Reading um, because we were seeing at the time that close reading was being used in some really harmful ways, we thought, to kids. So we tried to sort of write a counterpoint to that. And that sort of started my author journey um, and allowed me to, to now, um, with my wife Maggie Beatty Roberts, to go off on my own and, and consult and write and guest teach. Um, which I'm super honored to to be able to do. 
Fantastic. Well, in, in hearing what you said about being nervous to be in front of that group of sixth graders that first time, um, the very first experience I had as an undergraduate heading out to a pre-service experience, you know, I got there to that junior high and I remember the teacher telling me, it's okay to be nervous. If you're not at least a little bit nervous on the first day of school, you're not doing something right. That's and right. I, I, I can understand the humility and terror feeling quite well, even as I stand up in front of undergrads and graduates and teachers today. So definitely, definitely feel you with that one. That's thing, and I still and, feel that way. I mean, every time I walk in to teach a class, you know, of kids, because I do a lot of guest teaching, I still feel really nervous. And I think that's good, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think it speaks to the fact that you want them to learn something. You you want them to engage in some kind of intellectual journey and some emotional journey with you. And if you're not feeling it, they're not going to feel it either. So yeah, that's amazing. So you are an author and you have a book of your own recently, A Novel Approach. Tell us a little bit about what you're thinking uh, as teachers are planning for whole class reading instruction and individualizing instruction and especially what that means uh, with the reading writing connection, where, where, where and how do we help kids see their reading as a way to lead them into writing? Well, I think the first thing for me is that recently, especially, you know, I've been um, really thinking about how we listen or don't listen to teachers. You know, I think a lot of times when you leave the classroom, like I've been out of the classroom for a little bit, And there can be this pull to think, well, I know what the ideal answer is, right? And so all teachers should just live up to this ideal that I've thought of with a group of other people or that I've been able to do in these sort of isolated experiences in classrooms. And, you know, what I've noticed is that some people can live up to those ideals, but the vast majority of teachers find it unrealistic, right? Because of either situations or systems at school, um, balancing their own lives of having a family at home and being able to do a career and not being able to work until nine at night every night, right? So a novel approach really came from that of listening to teachers. You know, I'm a reading workshop person. I'm a writing workshop person. That's my true north. Um, It's how I've been raised as an educator but I was listening to teachers uh, buck up against that a little bit and say, this doesn't work for me all the time, or it doesn't work for me in this way for all kids all year long, right? Mm -hmm. And starting to really hear that. Um, I think that connects to writing too, you know? I think that um, I have an ideal way that I like to think about the instruction of writing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what I found is if I really listen to teacher after teacher after teacher talk about what's really challenging about that. Um, It's like, well, I have to listen, right? And think, well, how do we bridge those gaps between the reality that people face as they're trying to do these things in classrooms and the ideals that we might have about what writing should look like? Mm. So what does that look like then in in a moment to moment uh, process of decision making is your helping teachers get ready for reading workshop, writing workshop. The day ahead, we need to do a little of this and a little of that and a little of the other thing. What, what kind of thinking process do you go through as you plan instruction that way and help others to plan instruction that way? I think about, um, I really like to think about teaching as like problem solving, right? Like that's mm-hmm. really not some new thing. That's not copyright K. Roberts, but <laughs> <laughs> um, Uh, An example I'll give for writing and the connection to writing and reading is writing about reading, right? Like uh, doing things like annotations or long writes. And these feel like things that we, many of us want kids to be able to do in meaningful and engaged ways. Like, of course, I want as kids read to be able to stop and jot their thinking down somewhere. Of course, I want kids to be able to like reflect on their reading in profound ways in a longer format, right? Um, but as I was talking about things like, for me, it was post-iting or writing reading notebook entries or something, I kept getting these like continuous, repetitive complaints from teachers and kids, 
saying uh, everybody hates post-its. <laughs> the post the post-its suck. <laughs> you know, like they're they're not meaningful. You know what I mean? Sorry, three M. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, sticky notes. Uh, the, sticky notes. Yes. The adhesive notes uh, uh, are working for people in the way that that we were doing them. And then entries. You know, it again felt like this labor that no one was getting a lot out of. Teachers weren't seeing growth. Kids weren't finding meaning. So like listening to that, for me, the process is always, what is the real problem there? Do you know what I mean? Like, because I think it can sometimes sound when I say they can't do it, right? Or you know, when I'm talking about kids, or I feel this feeling of this doesn't work. Mm. There's this inclination to think that I'm just being resistant. Do you know what I mean? Or I don't believe in the big ideas of this thing. And if I just was convinced in the in the reason why this is important it would i would i would do what i have to do to make it work and i don't think that's what it is i think that it's that there's actual logistical things that aren't working or or something fundamental that needs to be solved so with post-its like the thing that wasn't working for a lot of people two things for especially middle and high school teachers but elementary school too um for sticky notes um, what wasn't working is um first of all the jots kids were doing weren't connected to the teaching that the teacher was offering so Mm. i'm offering strategies say on thinking about characters in profound ways in the books we read but the kids jots are like i don't know text to self connections questions about what's going to happen at the end do i mean like the kids were just doing whatever they responded to And that then felt like, why are we doing this, right? If, if the kids aren't going to practice my lessons. So me and a group of teachers just developed a very easy system where like the teacher used a piece of chart paper and just listed the lessons that she taught that week and then said, okay, every reading session, you need two to four jots and you can choose from this list, right? So I'm going to number them so you can number your post-its. I'm trying strategy two today. I'm trying strategy three today. So that I don't have to assign something for you to do. You have to choose what's meaningful for you as a reader, but it's connected to the And that's just one example. I think there's like a million examples like that where I have this ideal, but I'm feeling resistance because it's not working for me. And it's usually a question of like, there's a, there's something that, that matters about this. And then there's stuff that, I need to fix around that. Sure. Well, and it sounds to me, again, going back to your notion that teaching is problem solving, we have to make these very small little pivots and changes in some way. And this is maybe something I have been struggling with in the last few years. Like I, as much as I'm interested in education reform and trying to reimagine a whole system, I, I'm afraid that schedules and buses and athletics and life and vacations and things like that, we, we're not going to see a whole scale replacement to our current model of education. So what are we going to do in That's those right. moments that we have with students to make that time as effective and useful as possible? both individually for kids as well as for the whole class. And it sounds to me like you're, you're trying to live with that tension too and helping teachers understand that, hey, we could just, if we just see it in a slightly different perspective. That's right. that's gonna... Exactly. If you do it this way and you let go of this part of the ideal, you're going to be able to live up to what really matters about this thing, right? Because it's like these choices we make, they do matter they just don't always matter in exactly the way they're being told to us. Do you know what I mean? Like maybe it doesn't matter that my kids write their entries in a notebook. Maybe they can do it electronically. Maybe they can record their thinking about their reading, but like it matters that kids reflect on their reading right? In some way and do it in productive, meaningful ways. I also am just so grateful that there are people like, I love what you said about that. We're not going to change the whole system right now. Right? So how do we live inside the system we're in? I love that there are people out there who are trying to change the whole system. I think that's great. Keep going, Mm -hmm. right? Meanwhile, it takes all voices, right? Meanwhile, Mm -hmm. until that happens, we need to live in the now. Oh, yeah. Well, and and this is not to say either, and I want to be very clear, that there are not things that are fundamentally wrong with the system in terms of institutionalized 
yeah. racism and colonialism and we could get into a whole philosophical treatise about this and some other guests this season I've been talking with about this very topic but I think what I hear you saying again is this moment when we're working with an individual teacher here's the ideal here's where it's falling apart what can we pivot to help you get your kids and help your kids feel empowered to do these things too so yeah, and I'm talking very on the nerdy pedagogical side, not on the mm. social justice side, right? Like there's a different urgency um, when we're talking about issues of uh, equity. Absolutely, absolutely. So knowing that you have had classroom experience, literacy coaching experience, uh, having written your books, you're talking with teachers, I'm sure that it is difficult to pin down to just one mini lesson or one particular mentor text that you would find absolutely essential to use, but maybe something at least that's been on your radar recently. If you, if you were to walk into a classroom as soon as we got done and be nervous in front of those sixth graders again, <laughs> what, what's the lesson that you would pull out of your pocket and, and try to do uh, because it just works so well for you? Um. Well, there's a couple things. So in terms of the book that I'm the most excited about right now, um, I've had a chance to look at some previews of it. It's coming out at the end of November. It's uh, Shauna Coppola's writing Redefined, um, which okay. is coming out soon. And she's really looking at the question of um, how can we give kids a variety of mediums and ways to be, to be writing in, um, that it doesn't always have to be pen to paper, which I know a good company to, to be thinking mm -hmm. about. Um, what kinds of things can kids make if writing is making? Um, so that's the thing that I've been sort of uh, diving into and, and it has helped me to rethink and be courageous along with your work and many others with the kind of format and medium that kids are writing in. Um, writing lesson that I like the best, I, you know, I was thinking about this question and I think that, you know, again, I feel like I'm the least inspiring writing person to talk to in some ways because... Sure. The lessons that I love. So I love a combination of things when I'm helping kids write. Um, I love to give them mentors to immerse themselves in and to map out and to break down, like, how is this author constructing this piece? In what ways can I construct my piece like that, right? What moves are they using? How can I make those moves in my writing? So, you know, Ray has that beautiful chart, the wondrous words where she has kids do lots of inquiry on mentor text to name what she yeah. sees others doing. So I love that. Um, but then I also really love the idea of giving kids like super concrete structures to follow, not structures for templates of writing, but like, for example, um, if kids are trying to extend their thinking about an idea, right? And maybe it's mm -hmm. before an essay unit or something and they, have an idea of a claim about a character or about an idea in the world, but they're not quite sure what they think about it. Um, you know, I love the idea as a scaffold of giving kids some prompts to help them to think and analyze in new ways. Like to give kids a little list of like, oh, so you could say, I think, you could say this is important because, you could say this connects to the reason for this is, on the other hand, right? And that you can kind of make a mess of your thinking. <laughs> Like you can go in weird directions and then at the end kind of do a, oh, so what I'm really trying to say is to kind of see where you've journeyed in your thinking. Right. Um, right. I love prompts because I think they're, they help me, they help kids think new stuff. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. me, that's the thrill of writing, right? Is when I'm sitting down to a piece of paper and I don't know what I think or what I'm doing. And then at the end, I'm like, oh, that was cool what I came up with. Yeah. To go back to that idea of like the structures and the templates for a moment, though, I've struggled with this too. And I, I'm often, at least when I'm working with secondary and college colleagues, thinking about um, Graf and Birkenstein's, they say, I say yes. templates. Yep. And, and then we get in, and I won't say all the time, but I often will then get into, well, you're telling us not to do five paragraph essays, mm -hmm. but then you're telling us to use sentence templates. Yeah. Yep. How do you square that circle? What is it that you say to teachers when you're like, well, you don't want me to be formulaic, but now you're telling me to use these sentence templates. What, how, how do you approach that? So I think there's places here that I have strength, and I think this is also a place where I have some weakness. I think that I can be a little dependent on the scaffolds of sentence starters. Um, 
uh, I have a, a, a friend and colleague, Ariel, who's pushed back against my sort of dependence on, on certain starter prompts, and I think it's valid. Um, here's what I, where I like to live or where my comfort zone is that I think maybe I need to get pushed out of sometimes. Um, I think it's about choice. Do you know, like there's a difference between me saying, you will use these sentence starters in this order to make a paragraph, yeah. right? Or you will use this template for your essay in order to do the job and it will be part of the rubric that you follow this template I gave you. Versus, hey, here's a bunch of sentence starters that might help you do cool stuff. <laughs> What do you think you want to use to do that? Or let's look at a bunch of mentors that fit different sort of typical templates, right? That authors write when they write essays or journeys of thought. And you choose which one of those is going to be the best one that you can then adapt, right? So like, if I think about the sweet spot between sort of template sentence starter thinking and freedom, it's mm -hmm. that I have choice and I can adapt it. Mm -hmm. And that then I think becomes something that has fluidity and creativity. Um, at the same time, the critique I need to put on my practice is that um, it still is the question of when do you take them away, right? Like when do you remove those scaffolds and say, you don't need this list anymore. You don't need a template to write. Just think about how your writing should go and do it that way. Um, so I struggle with that. Well, and even the moments where, you know, even the best teacher being as collaborative and thoughtful and responsive to children as possible will still say, and now the training wheels are gone. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, that you have to recognize when that moment is for an individual um, student. And I appreciate how you just said, you know, essay as, as a journey of thought. And, and I, 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 of course, cannot remember the full official etymology of essay right now, but I, I think it's something like to think or to yeah. discover or to journey. Yeah. So I, I do really appreciate that idea as well. So maybe shifting a little bit more broadly then at this point, as you talk with teachers, as you go to conferences, as you work with kids, what are the big burning issues? What are the trends? What are the topics? What are the inquiries that people have? What would you say is important right now about teaching writing? What are the conversations we need to be having? I think, uh, you know, it depends a little bit age range that we're talking about, right? Like if it's middle and high school, um, I think the constant struggle for us is finding that balance between sort of school writing that's more academic, more formal, more essay, maybe more structured, right? That, that kind of writing and making sure that at the same time we're developing writers, makers, thinkers in the world and, and having that sense that like every kid is a writer, <laughs> even if they're not a particularly uh, naturally talented academic writer, right? That we can still find places for them to learn that they can originate an idea, figure out how to take it through a process of creation and put it out into the world in a way that, that feels good. Um, I think that balance is incredibly hard to strike with the schedules that we're under with, um, I think it's the thing that as much as the Common Core may have steered our profession in some interesting directions, it's I, writing is, I think, has taken the, the hardest hit in terms of uh, kids being able to be explorers and creators and, and uh, thinkers and makers, you know, um, I think it really pushes kids to write in a certain kind of way that is only one way of writing um, and uh, uh, not going to get all kids to the place that we want them to get to. Right. Well, and this even circles back to what we were just talking about with Shauna's work and you kindly mentioned my work and I would even go a step further back to Tom Romano yes. and multi-genre work and thinking about this idea that multi-genre, multimedia, multiple perspectives, multiple voices, and then even to think too, like to help students understand that you may watch a YouTube video, but you have to understand there's writing that goes in the high quality ones, right? Like there are some that are just stream of thought and they're streaming yeah. their video games or whatever. But some of these vlogs that are are produced and are sassy and fun and have a really kind of good 
timing and humor that that's writing and that takes work and you're not just going to be a YouTuber all of a sudden <laughs> right. uh, without being a writer. And, and I think that's really, really important to keep in well, mind. When I, was, when I was in middle school, you know, I did, I was a pretty poor student in general. I was good at school. I was good at stuff. So I always passed and I generally got good grades, right? Cause I was that jerk who could show up, you know, do the thing the night before, not read the book and get the good grade. It was lovely. I, horrible for me later on in life, right? But it worked really well in middle and high school. Yeah, you played school well. It's all good. Yeah, I played school well. I uh, got rewarded for it, right? And I remember that I had this whole vibrant writing life outside of school. You know, my friend and I, Terry, we used to make these cassette tapes because it was back in the 80s. We used to make all these cassette tapes where we would write scripts, you know, and play different teachers and... <laughs> and uh, go through drafting process and collect ideas. I mean, we went through the whole thing and I spent more energy on that stuff than I ever did on a school paper. And like, I, I'm glad I learned how to write school papers too. It's not about taking that away or saying there isn't a place for that or that's not a need. But man, if we could tap into that energy that young people have to create, to create things that are fun, that are meaningful to them, that speak to youth culture, not future English majors, right? Sometimes I always wonder about English classes in particular. It's like, is the dream that all of our kids are English majors? Because I don't think that's the goal, right? Right. Very few of them will become English majors. So can we broaden a sense of what we want kids to do? Oh, yeah. Well, it's the both and moment, right? Like I, there's a line I will often say in the midst of a workshop or a webinar or something to the effect of, I still want for my children and for all children to put words into sentences and sentences into paragraphs and paragraphs into essays. But I also want, so it's a, it's a both and, it, it, you know, infographics and podcasts and vlogs and websites are all part of that. Um, and yeah, I think you, you raise an interesting point too. I mean, there, there's, as as far as our professional organizations have supported 21st century literacies and have you know brought in multiple perspectives on media and all kinds of things like that i think there's still a question as to what what we're preparing especially secondary english teachers to do and and i'm less familiar you know with the elementary standards and what happens in pre-service education in elementary but even there too i think i could could ask like are yeah are we preparing english majors or are we preparing people to be citizens of the world and that's a really important question well and that idea of i i sort of mildly obsessed by the real question of what does college and career readiness look like right and like it yeah. doesn't uh, i mean there's some overlap for sure when i look at things like state standards you know i, I look at some stuff and i'm like yeah absolutely, that's awesome but like man, that's not what got me through college. You know what I mean? Man, that's not the kind of writing that got me in my career and through my career. Yeah. Well, and even now with my college students that I'm working with, trying to figure out with, you know, fortunately I, I've got two undergraduate courses right now. One's a writing intensive, it's educational technology. So helping them see that writing is more yeah. than just writing the typical reflection or paper, but you can compose an infographic and that yeah. counts as writing. And then also with my honors undergraduate students, helping them see that, oh, yes, you can plan and record a podcast. Yeah. You can plan and record a digital story. Like these are all acts of writing and they're important for you in this modern world. Whether you're going to be, you know, a business major, an engineer, a teacher, you have to start thinking about how to express yourself through multiple forms of media. So. Yeah, I also think about like conventions, right? Because that's the other big conversation that I have with writing. Grammar and conventions, spelling, that kind of thing versus sort of, I'm a writing workshop person, right? So I tend to lean towards things like volume and process and, you know, meaning and craft and all that good stuff. And like, sometimes I think like, you know, I, I too want my kids, like I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, I very much want them to be able to know and in that sort of innate sense of what a sentence sounds like and how to play with commas in ways that make sense and our smart choices and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, but where, uh, the thing that I found with my students and that I find across the board with students is that if I want to teach kids conventions, if I want to teach them to think about what a sentence is, 
it's a lot easier to get them to play around with that in a genre and a medium that they're engaged with. Like, I found it infinitely easier uh, to do a syntax study when we did things like narrative or poetry or open genre, where kids were taking those lessons and putting it on something that had like some meaning and value to them. It was really hard to teach conventions in an essay unit because they already were like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't yeah. want to do this, right? They're already yeah. unengaged. I'm like, hey, let's do an unengaging thing. Wait for it on an unengaging thing yes, yes right and the whole class is like oh so yeah. i think it 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 feeds into all of it right like it's the idea of like if kids aren't doing if kids aren't writing we can't help them become better writers mm, mm-hmm. yeah. if they're not writing we can't help them get better right well and, and your point there just a moment ago reminds me just of kind of the potency of a strategy like sentence combining like Mm -hmm. how about rather than daily oral language where we look for errors in some inauthentic task we actually take center and sentences from mentor text or take our own and play with them and 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 figure out what that looks like and even if we're not learning every grammatical you know word and phrase to describe what we're doing at least we're going through that process Mm -hmm. of understanding that words can be changed from nouns to verbs. And it matters where words appear in sentences. And it matters when you put things in a list with commas as compared to individual sentences and things like that. That's right. Yeah. Well, so obviously writing is pretty important in your life. And I'm I'm just wondering now, as someone who said you would never be a teacher and never be a writer, <laughs> how do you see yourself, Kate Robert, as a teacher writer? What is it, what is the role of writing in your life right now? I mean, writing's been the, one of the biggest gifts of my life. Um, you know, I've I've worked on it hard, um, uh, but it has enabled me to uh, communicate my beliefs and refine my beliefs like I think that when you think as a writer in the world your thinking process changes too right it's not just about what you get on the paper like when I'm in a project I'm I'm working it internally so much before I go to type things out or to write things out and so you know it it enables me to articulate things to myself that then makes me, I think, a more alive, deeper, hopefully, (laughs) sometimes person. (laughs) Like I just was writing a small piece and the question was, what turning points essentially have you had in your work in equity in education, Mm -hmm. right? So I have to write this thing. I have kind of an assignment and a deadline, but the process of thinking through that allowed me to realize so much that um, I was failing at before, you know, and really look at it and name it of where I wasn't living up to some of the things that I've learned since then, uh, that it means to be a a teacher who is fostering equity. Um, And then to articulate what I'm trying to do now and what I want to do better. And like, that's all because of writing. Like if, if I didn't have a assignment and a deadline, I probably wouldn't think about it really as much as, (laughs) I should, right? It, it puts a kind of pressure on you. Um, so writing is, is huge for me. And also, you know, I think most people struggle with writing and so do I. I don't like it. I don't want to write ever. <laughs> All I want to do is play video games and watch TV. <laughs> You're like, I don't want to sit down and write. So there's always that feeling of resistance, just like going to the gym or doing a spiritual practice. Like anything that feeds you is going to take some effort. And so I have to put that effort in, but the rewards are so uh, great. I can fully agree with that as you're thinking about exercise and just maintaining your eating and mindfulness and it all matters. And yeah, I I think uh, Carol Jago had referred to that as um, I don't like the writing while I'm doing it. I like the feeling of having it done. (laughs) That's that's exactly it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the writing that you do. I appreciate the teaching that you do, the work that you do with and for teachers and with and for kids. And it's been a great pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, Troy. Thanks. Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. 
Discover more episodes and subscribe on your favorite streaming platforms. Or check out filmed episodes on YouTube. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com.